welcome to climate channel climate conversation with kamrul choudhury climate action pathways episode 54 the glasgow climate conference of parties cop 26 tan and dustin now we have to look back what was the outcome how far the planet to be protected have we done enough or not what shall we confront on our road to shamal sheik at cop 26 in egypt come now next year 2000 Twenty-second. Have we done fairly at Glasgow? So we would like to look at that outcome and also look forward on our road to Sharm El Sheikh at COP27. Without much ado, I would now like to request David McCurry. you have been following this process for many years have been on climate front for many years so what is your take how do you see glasgow some says it is half full half glass empty some says especially the youths they are not satisfied even even secretary general he was not say happy he said it is in uh, intensive care even at melivan uh, who was uh, at one point of time environment secretary of uk now shadow environment secretary uh, he also said uh, it is in intensive care and alok sharma cop 26 president himself said the pulse is very weak what is you take what is your reflection how do you see whether we made some advancement uh, especially uh, around article 6 Uh, market mechanism non market mechanism where is rule book uh, yes we made uh, some progress over there mm. but on adaptation front adaptation finance adaptation goal definition of climate finance raising climate finance ambition especially what about 2021 uh, say 100 billion dollar 2020 what about 2021 that is yet to be settled that way or pre 2025 and post 2025 long term goal for climate finance what about mitigation ndcs the ndcs submitted so far uh, are not near mm, to 1.5 degree uh, global goal paris agreement goal to keep it alive so windows of windows of opportunities are shrinking fast day in and day out either we have had enough to rescue billion of people who are on the hook of climate change across the planet in different continents especially in the climate vulnerable countries ldcs aocs african countries affected by drought and desertification so david you take uh, you've touched on a number of issues there uh, important ones um i'm i i should preface my remarks by saying i'm i'm sort of a glass half full kind of guy so you'll you'll get us uh, always get sort of the the optimistic take on things from me um first of all it's it's probably worth it's hard you know there's just so many things going on it's worth looking at 
COP26 and sort of a before and after with and without perspective and to try to get a sense of what was accomplished and, and what's changed perhaps. Um, one of the things that's changed is you can argue we've moved now from negotiations largely to implementation of the Paris Agreement. The rule book and the basic framework is in place. You mentioned Article 6, some real advances there, which was a major bottleneck. Uh, loss and damage, still some ways to go. There's this uh, group coming together by April with from, you know, comments and, and a process is at least in place there. So I think that this, that's a fundamental shift, you know, from, from negotiations to implementation. And I hope that going into COP27, we'll probably come back to that, but I, I think that should shape the way that people view Sharm el Sheikh. The second is it started in Madrid following the IPCC report on 1.5 degrees. But I think the sort of sense of urgency and the shift from well under two degrees to 1.5 degrees as the benchmark, I think that occurred uh, clearly. And it was partly with the U.S. coming back and the leadership there, you know, not having, you know, the, the Trump administration's, you know, writing off climate change as a hoax and so forth. You know, at least we didn't have that kind of noise. And, it, and there was a, a general global consensus and focus around the 1.5 degree uh, target and, and sense of urgency, as you said, the NDCs just don't add up. So keeping that... The, the, the UK presidency tried to keep that alive. I think nature's role, really, there are some big advances there. Uh, one can be sort of uh, cynical about it, yet another deforestation announcement uh, without teeth, but still the role of nature and uh, in both mitigation and to a lesser extent adaptation, important. The mention of fossil fuels and coal, and, and uh, that, I think the, the biggest thing that came out of the G20 on the, you know, that, that closed the day before the opening of the COP was this willingness to adopt language around what the G20 has been discussing since 2009. And that is the removal of harmful subsidies and the need to, to make adjustments in the global energy economy. And finally, as you mentioned on adaptation, um, I think that the focus on impacts of climate change, and although that, of course, began with Paris and carried over a bit through the interim, I think it really came up now, particularly around loss and damage. And so those areas on the implementation shift, on urgency, on nature's role, on the acknowledgement way too late, but at least finally better late than never, acknowledgement on fossil fuels, and then on on the impacts of climate change, adaptation, loss of damage. I see those all as, as, as accomplishments in varying degrees. Thank you, uh, David, for your initial uh, take. Now I would now like to request uh, Tony Brooks to share uh, your reflection. How do you see the Glasgow Conference of Parties? the outcome. Do you think uh, it was enough? Uh, though uh, we know that uh, at COP26, uh, 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 coal phase out, uh, has turned to phase down, uh, lose phase down uh, at the 11th hour. And also uh, Article 6.2 uh, transaction uh, levy, 5% uh, levy, to adaptation fund for developing countries, especially the climate vulnerable countries, uh, was not, hmm, uh, say, agreed upon uh, at the 11th hour because of uh, opposition of one or two parties. So, hmm, how do you see, uh, though uh, climate, uh, say, adaptation finance uh, was agreed uh, to be doubled uh, from 2019 low level? to 2025, 2025. Uh, even if it is double, uh, it is not mm, sufficient for adaptation finance for developing countries. Many are developing countries. Many are 
climate vulnerable countries. So what is your take, Tony? You have to unmute. Tony, yeah. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things that you've, uh, questions you've asked me that um, I'm not really in a great position to answer, but um, I am sort of get, just getting on with things. There are a lot of people that I'm talking to and working with, and we're just getting on with things. And rather than um, see this whole funding thing as a cost, then it's they see it as an investment. And uh, I, my project is to enable people to um, to uh, to sort of uh, take on projects and 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 start new projects. Entirely, the end result is, is uh, absorbing carbon dioxide. So it's all based around the most efficient, the most cost effective, the most scalable way of absorbing carbon dioxide and putting it back in the ground or locking it up otherwise. And that is the through uh, industrial hemp. So, you know, like it, 18 tons, 15 tons per hectare absorption per crop in 120 days or less. And uh, so that, that's what I'm centering on. That's what I'm, I'm working sort of every day on and uh, building a system to enable people to do that. I'm talking to, I've, I've, put, I've connected up um, a couple of organizations uh, this last week. In fact, uh, we, I was in a, a Zoom meeting with you last Thursday. And um, uh, after that, uh, I had a Zoom meeting with them. Uh, so one of these organisations has a system that you can, that will, you, you, you take the unit, you put it down by the crops, and when the crop's grown, you cut the crop down, you feed it through this system, and it comes out at the other end, comes like oil, or CBD oil, or fuel oil, or vegetable oil, uh, it's plant protein, uh, fuel brick, uh, which is a direct, it, it's a similar um, energy density to coal, so you can use it in coal fired power stations. And so you've got a cyclical instead of a fossil um, fuel, you know, sort of thing going on. Um, and there's, there's so many things you can make out of it. So, really, what, what the aim is, uh, what we're doing on, the, like I say, on this side. Not the top 26 side, not the not the blue zone and all that, not the official government people and all this sort of thing. And we're just getting on with the job. And there is a massive effort and it will grow. So you said that I asked you last week um, that if, if you would help by supporting um, my objective to get uh, African governments where growing and processing industrial hemp is not legal, if you would support me in trying to change that, and you said you you will, and I'm so, I am so excited about that, because that is so important. Your, your uh, opinions uh, and so on carry a great deal of weight, and they will do with these African governments. So my aim is to show these people these are, this, is, this is not a, another handout. It's not, oh, we have, to, we have to put some money into this to fix it because it's broken, right? So what this, what this project is going to be is that it's called climate-crisis.team. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to, first of all, we're working on the, the, the toolkit to enable people to do, to do the, uh, the project and so on. And I will uh, say again what I was talking to my CEO a few weeks ago. I asked him how long he thought it would take. If you, went, if you were in Africa, because uh, it's all based in Africa, this, this section, um, and you wanted to assemble a team, you wanted to get in touch with people like machinery uh, and equipment suppliers, 
seed suppliers, landowners, farmers, people with skills, people who are going to take the product and all that. And all he, he said, I asked him how long it, he thought it would take. He's he's been there, uh, you know, in Zimbabwe and Malawi, where we operate mainly uh, for the for two before COVID anyway for two years on the trot, you know. And so he reckoned it would take about two years to set such a project up. So this system, when people are on it, and I, thousands of people are going to be on it, then uh, he said with that system, it will cut that down to uh, two weeks to two months. Yeah. So that's, you can then, that means that you can have, you can have grown these crops, you can have processed them, and they're not just for, it's not a money sink, it's a carbon sink, yeah? yeah? So there is, there, when you've grown the crop, you, you've got, you can make money out of it. So they can improve their economies, people's lives can be lifted, and it improves the soil so that the soil becomes arable and good enough for growing crops. So in 10 years, yeah. In ten years, when this project is like completely normal and every day and so on, then then millions of lives will be lifted. Uh, no more food insecurity in most places, and a rebalancing of the climate because there is so much potential for that. Two hundred and two million hectares of unused arable marginal land. I know it's a really crazy big idea, but if you planted all that with one crop of hemp, then 3.6 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide absorbed, based on 18 tonnes per hectare. The, that term machine in, in uh, uh, Iceland, the new Climeworks machine, wonderful and all that, but $15 million, 4,000 tonnes a year. So, so that's what I'm concentrating on okay. every day. It's, it's exhausting. My my flat, my apartment, is a complete tip. I see. <laughs> and and hopefully uh, next year uh, African Golf, say uh, it will be held in Africa. And uh, uh, you are working in Africa, so um, African people, uh, if they are benefited. Um, and you can show some success stories uh, and also uh, hand over some uh, technology. And also uh, they see uh, that uh, on the ground, uh, it is um, so not only uh, removing um, uh, carbon dioxide, but also uh, benefiting them um, uh, in terms of raising their uh, agriculture output, uh, food ensuring food security and also livelihood. Uh, uh, that will be a, a great um, uh, deal. Like, and migration because because if you can grow, if you are, you know, you are in your own country, you can grow food or you can work, you can be employed, you can have a business, you can make money, you can feed your family, you know, uh, you can get an education. Because all that stems from basic secure things, yeah. Okay. So okay. then you are less you are less vulnerable to the voices of of people who would use you use you for their own end, you know, who would who want to cause disruption because it's a, an opportunity for them okay. to make money. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, I'll come back to you again. Uh, David, you have been working in Asia Pacific for many years. Uh, how do you see um, Asian journey, uh, especially along the um, climate smart development, climate smart, uh, uh, say, livelihood, um, climate smart pathways uh, in, uh, say, this um, decade, uh, crucial decade? when uh, we need to cut back our emissions steeply in Asia Pacific and also uh, say ensure livelihood, ensure food security, uh, water security, energy security and 
so on and so forth, health security. Yeah. Yes, you're so right. You're so right. I think the Asia Pacific region is really where this battle will be won or lost. Um, I wish I could say I was a little bit more optimistic about the overall economic transformation. I think we're seeing at the government level, uh, a lot of uh, slow but steady progress, you know, on things like coal, on the energy and transport sectors, transformation with technology. I think the Asian governments, particularly East Asian governments, and as well as, as India, see opportunities for their own technology transfer and, and uh, business opportunities there. So uh, that's partly driving it. But uh, uh, it is a little bit hard to be optimistic, frankly, with the business as usual for the, for the key sectors. Um, agribusiness sector has a long way to go, as, as you know, um, Rule. And uh, so that's one that's going to really require uh, some concerted effort and hasn't gotten enough attention. I think a big agribusiness is still pretty much following business as usual. Um, we are seeing some changes in the power supply sector, as I said, and, and in transport, electrification, uh, grid investments. It's going to require hundreds of billions of dollars of investment over the next couple of decades to, to make those changes. Meanwhile, the fossil fuel industry, with the exception of the coal industry, which now I think is starting to see that it's on the way out, but definitely oil and gas uh, are not giving up. And even the coal industry in Australia or Indonesia or China are still very much uh, hoping to maintain business as usual. So that's uh, a bit discouraging. I would say, you know, there was a lot of hype before we went to Glasgow about the finance sector and, and the whole G funds and the, the various coalitions that came together around standards and themes for sustainable finance at the macro level, it's promising. But if you talk to people within the finance sector day in, day out, you know, not much has changed. Uh, the investor side, the, the owners of the capital, they want to see their money going into things that are that is uh, meeting sustainability standards, but there are no accepted standards still. So it's very easy to greenwash. It's very easy to move around that. So we, we have a long way to go. Um, but I do think Asia Pacific is showing some signs of progress, uh, some innovation, some entrepreneurial spirit, some government leadership as well. Uh, the beginnings of showing the way for uh, Africa, uh, for even for the Latin American countries. Uh, and in the Pacific, you can see cross-fertilization, cross-learning between, say, the C Caribbean states and the Pacific states uh, in small island development and attention to, to their uh, problems and opportunities. So... Uh, so it's hard to focus on any opportunities given their, their existential threat that they're facing. So um, I don't know, it's a mixed, it's a mixed view, uh, but, I, but I do see uh, elements of leadership there and institutions are stepping up too, like my old institution, Asian Development Bank, committing financing of 100 billion uh, by 2030 and also uh, paying more attention to agriculture sector helping with the coal um, transition out of, even, even for this sort of uh, um, uh, energy tran um, transition um, initiative that they've taken on uh, where they're trying to help figure out ways to buy out existing coal-fired power plants and convert them. All of this is promising. Okay. Uh... I would now like to uh, go back to Tony mm, again. So, uh, how do you see the future of mm, Africa uh, facing the adversities of climate change? Tony. Tony. Well, obviously, 
Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Uh, okay. Um, obviously, there are huge challenges, and there are some things that are far too far down the track to change, weather-wise and so on. But um, whatever we can do now, and and as soon as possible, is is very important. Whatever it is, it's important. We need to. Everything is required. Yeah. So, uh, oh, well, there's, I think there's a lot of big thinking needs to be done by different governments and they've got to work together and so on and uh, collaborate. Um, and there are, I think there are a lot of things that can be done, which I hope will make a quicker change than some people would say is, is you know, expected. Um, there are some interesting things. I mean, like uh, a couple of years ago, I was in uh, a meeting at Leeds University, which is across the park from me. And um, there was a, uh, a, a meteorology professor there giving a lecture. And he was talking about the, the, uh, that belt that goes across the Sahara. Is what it called the African? It's like a massive hedge thing, yeah. The Great Green Belt, yeah. Uh, and uh, so, but I'm like, uh, I, I think out of the box, you know, uh, because of the way my mind works. So they was talking about this uh, rabbit-proof fence in Australia, and on one side, it's uh, it's it goes basically north south. It's very long. Um, and uh, on one side, there's not much vegetation on, on the other, because there's rabbits on the one side, and not this, on the other side of the rabbit-proof fence, then there aren't any, and there's all crops, and it's all green. And he's, he explained that when, when the, the, you know, sort of the earth turns and the weather comes around and all that, then when uh, you, you get over the, the, uh, the green part, it's so much cooler, and you get rain. You know, so I said to him, I said, well, this here, uh, this great green belt going across from left to right, what if you sort of in a different place, I'm not talking about replanting it, <laughs> but if you got, if you started in other areas and you, you created vertical north-south yeah. belts in bands going across, areas then wouldn't you get this rain pattern repeating to an extent and uh, he said uh, yes you would so <laughs> he said perhaps we should work together in the future and maybe we can let you use the uh, the university uh, supercomputers to to plot that out it'd be interesting to see what what will happen so perhaps if you grew um, like I know you can't plant like everywhere in this marginal land with them all at once. But what if you did it in, verti in big vertical stripes, in north-south stripes, then, then that, would, that would help with it. So it's, I think that's just, a, just an idea, just an example. But I think that ideas like that are, you know, should be mooted, should be talked about, and should be explored to see what can be done to make the best thing happen quickest. It's like looking in the pantry and seeing what there is. What can we make out of what's in the pantry or what's in the fridge? Underground. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, David, uh, what is your uh, say recommendation for um, uh, COP27? Because we have to move past and have also a lot of homework given at Glasgow. Uh, especially, we have to define the um, definition of climate finance. We have to also set the global goal for adaptation. And also, uh, we have to uh, discuss finance facility for uh, loss and damage, climate induced loss and damage. And also, uh,
say doubling or quadrupling uh, climate adaptation finance and also long term climate finance uh, and then also we have to revisit uh, the um, ndcs uh, so that uh, it can align with 1.5 degrees so there are lot of homework lot of uh, work along the article 6 uh, rule book uh, and also uh, fixing uh, this rule and also apply uh, the robust um, transparency mechanism uh, avoiding double counting duplication and also uh, keeping the integrity of market mechanism and also non market approaches collaborations david yeah that's a lot i agree <laughs> um well the good news is they did at least agree to come back uh to revisit the the nationally determined contribution so the government level commitments will be back on the table again in 2022 so hopefully the ratchet effect can help move closer to the 1.5 target for government commitments uh, i think that the opportunity to bring together a lot of these outside announcements that were made in glasgow and to link them up with what the government action is going i think that there'll be a lot of homework around that some of those elements will touch on what you just mentioned around finance especially uh within the negotiations of course there is still this uh a question of of climate finance i'm a bit more optimistic about the post 2025 climate finance ambition than i am about accelerating uh from you know to the 2023 from to 22 and so forth on the 100 billion dollar target um but uh, uh i do think that it's firmly now on the agenda especially because they're simultaneously as you mentioned thinking about uh meeting parity between climate mitigation and climate adaptation funding uh through a doubling or a tripling of adaptation uh, resources so that's uh that's now a very clear aspiration at least in the public sector it is and in the private sector you see this uh coalition for climate resilient investment for example which is a lot of major insurance companies and pension fund holders and others asset management firms who who recognize the physical risk of climate change and are starting to to shift private finance that direction and blend it with public financing so i think that it can go further um loss and damage facility uh yeah obviously you cannot close out properly the the paris agreement without dealing with that subject and it's a it's an existential moral question uh with respect to the fate of countries whose economies and in some cases their very existence uh is under threat um we'll have to see what form that takes i think you need some kind of financing mechanism whether you know the the various ideas for facility are rather vague i think it's going to be difficult for the developed countries um to commit to an open ended something you know they're they're very fearful of the liability issues there but i think uh a very robust funding mechanism of some sort recognizing that you now have science behind connecting individual uh disasters to what is expected to occur as a result of climate change that that allows for triggers uh for funding when there's a climate related disaster and link that up with front end uh preparedness and adaptation work i think there's a lot that can be done and so i'm 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 keen to work on that uh, in close touch with others at the you know the uh global center for adaptation and uh gef and green climate fund and others who are very keen to contribute as well so i guess i'm optimistic on that front it's going to be a tough haul it'll be very difficult uh uh discussions when we get to charmel shake but those are good and needed discussions and they'll 
help push us further ahead. With that positive mood, with that optimism, uh, I think I should stop uh, for today uh, in this 54th uh, episode of Climate Conversation with Kamrul Sodri uh, from Climate Seven. It was a great pleasure to have you, David, and also Tony. Uh, your reflection, your uh, comments, your observation, your reflection are quite prudent and hopefully that will pave the way for us all to protect this planet, Mother Earth, and keep the hope of 1.5 degree temperature rise goal, Paris Agreement global goal alive. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, David and Tony. Yes, <laughs> my pleasure. For you. Yeah, thank you. Good seeing you again. Take good care, yeah. my friend. Take yeah, care. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Okay. Mm. Welcome to